Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy. It is August. This is our month end podcast. And I have the pleasure, the absolute pleasure of being here with Kevin today. Kevin, so what's kind. going on? Too kind, really. Oh, just enjoying some summer. It's about 115 on average in Dallas and Houston every day. So uh, good luck to all of us to survive, right? This is, I know everyone says this, but this is the hottest summer that I've experienced in the 12 years I've been here, without a doubt. So it's the hottest summer since 2011. And we have been I got in here in 2011. One degree short of the record high, like several days in a row. So right. Good. So <laughs> now I have some stats right to back it up. <laughs> There's some true ones. I have a local weatherman likes to tweet. So he lets us know all these fun facts. Well, let's so, go through the rundown, Tom. Bringing you a look at the past month and what may come, here's the latest financial update. How'd markets do this month? <clears throat> so equity markets up again. Uh, S&P, the big large cap, now pretty leaning heavily growth. as up 3%, small cap up 5.5%. Um, Europe a little lower, not lower, but lower returns uh, up about 3%. Emerging markets really picking up about six and a quarter. Um, Pretty broadly positive for stocks. What's up with July? Just a good time for the uh, thermostats and stocks. Yeah, I think uh, it, it was a good month. It was. It's been a good start to the year. Um, July was the fifth month uh, winning streak for the S and P five hundred. So that's the thirty eighth time there's been a five month winning streak since nineteen twenty eight. Um, it went on to make six months, twenty nine of those thirty seven times. So we'll see if August this month can be the 30th time in history for a six month winning streak on the S&P 500. And uh, by the way, those 29 times that the S&P had a five month winning streak, July happened to be the fifth month for those times. And all four of those times we finished positive between now and the end of the year. So although seasonality is against us august uh, is august and september are the two worst months typically for the s p 500 um if history is any indication we might have uh we might have a strong finish uh between now and the end of the year yeah the other key things i saw happening in markets um for at least the equity markets it's a little change in who's leading uh energy seven and a half percent up for the month communication services up seven percent uh, and the kind of the ones that were really rallying before consumer discretionary and information technology only up two and a half percent. So we could have a little changing of the guard, which is a sign of a healthy market. And then as far as style, uh, growth and value about even uh, small, actually over large, which is a good thing to see quality outperforming momentum and minimum volatility uh, dividends, still a good game to follow along to. So any takeaway sector or style wise? No, I think you know the the magnificent seven that you saw lead this market throughout the oh, year. I got, I, I got a bone to pick you on that one. It's, so I, uh, I hope you bring this up. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, look at Apple. Apple, Apple just was a uh, one trillion market cap company, and then as of the last week, it just lost, I think, two hundred and fifty billion, bringing it down to under a trillion again. So you're seeing a lot of the the big winners year to date starting to give up some some steam a lot of the heavy tech names yeah. are starting to pull back and you know it's your typical rotation like you said you're starting to see money go into the cyclicals and the defensive names healthcare financials energy um they're starting to make a little bits of uh, a rebound because they've they've been lagging and you're starting to see the equally weighted s p 500 rsp starting to have a reversion back to the mean because you had a very very wide delta between the s p 500 and then the equally weighted S and P five hundred. So yeah, I think yeah, it's, well, I think it's normal and natural. Thirty eight. That's wild. Yeah. But to to your point about the magnificent seven, yeah, we all know Nvidia and Meta are uh, off to the races, more than doubling uh, 
um, this year, which is great. But who had semiconductors and cruises as the top two kind of subsectors? I mean, Carnival and Royal Caribbean up over 100%, uh, even Norwegian Cruise Line up about 50% year to date. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's well, surprising. I'll tell you who didn't, hedge funds. Hedge funds year on a year-to-date basis have lost, or estimated to have lost $6 billion. I just read this in, in Bloomberg, $6 billion on betting against uh, carnivals. I mean, um, well, we uh, talked about that last year, all the debt they were going to have to refinance that they took out during COVID just to survive as companies was all going to have to be refinanced this year. And meanwhile, their stocks are doubling in value. I did, <laughs> the bet that they laid out crazy. made sense. The results you, don't. Yeah, the smartest people are supposed to be the smartest people in the world, all begging against it. And it goes it goes the opposite direction. So I think this year so far has surprised a lot. Yeah. And I, I think semiconductors, we've talked about Dow theory before of uh, the old Dow theory is transports and industrials, both making new highs, confirmation of a bull market. The new Dow theory is throwing in semiconductors instead of transport, saying the modern economy doesn't run on rails. It runs on electrons and semiconductors doing great, really strong leading indicator. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, we've had just the Goldilocks scenario. I mean, every data... Uh, report that's come out in the last month or two months, you know, inflation coming down for the most part, both super core core and headline. You've had uh, growth GDP picking up, but not too much because we don't want jobs picking up. We want jobs going the other way, which they're starting to. You have inflation starting to come down. So we've had everything hit to put this market where it's at, which is kind of scary because if anything goes wrong, um, you could see a quick five to 10, maybe even more percent correction um, with any negative news. I mean, this market is priced. I mean, the Ford P and the S&P, I think, is over 19 now. So it's starting to be a little bit expensive. You're going to either have to have valuation expansion or a big shift in, in earnings to get you to your $5,000 at year, the, uh, year end target on the S&P 500, which I don't know. We're still a little ways away from there. The cruise lines are going to get us there. They're going to power it all the way to the top. <laughs> um, well, let's segue into inflation and interest rates as we kind of move into bonds. But uh, I thought there was a great headline in the Financial Times last month that the Swedish were blaming Beyonce uh, for some of their bad inflation numbers. <laughs> Apparently, she had a concert. And so then all the hotel data, all the restaurant data, all the things they used to measure inflation were way up. And they said, oh, that's a one-time thing because Beyonce was here. I uh, I find that hard to believe. I maybe it's a small country. She is no. She is no Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift just <laughs> is going to do a billion dollars, a billion dollars. So the in Swifties profit are going to be the next from, wave of from her tour, home. and it's expected that she actually generated four to five billion just in ancillary stuff, merchandise, people coming into town uh, to eat out of restaurants, hotel stays. I mean, she has single handedly moved global GDP. Which is so she which is will pretty amazing. Uh, be the first person to crack a billion dollars on her worldwide tour when she starts the European leg. The previous record was in the 900s by Elton John, and you know she's on track to crush that number, which is wild. I went to one of her shows. It's fantastic. I, I mean, I'm a you went to the most recent of the Eras tour. No, you, no, Tom. yeah, yeah, the, the one in Houston. Yeah, I paid a ridiculous amount and for the tickets. Kidney, so and you got to go, huh? I'm proud to say I added to that statistic of the uh, billion dollars in profit. <clears throat> Well, inflation is a problem here and abroad. Uh, here, it seems to be come down a lot. Uh, over in the UK, it's uh, hoping to have inflation to 5.4%, so they continue to raise rates. Um, the ECB broadly across Europe are noticing, oh, we have a little bit of a problem. But one exception to that is Italy uh, is seeing their inflation rate come crashing down because their growth is coming crashing down. So they might be what I would consider one of the weaker economies in Europe. So if their growth is hurting and inflation is coming down from it, I would expect that Germany, the UK, France, other places that traditionally have stronger economies, they're going to roll over next. And if we keep raising rates like we have been, I would expect the US at some point to roll over as well. And we're starting to see that employment data. We're starting to see inflation data. You know, let's, let's, I agree. And I think there's two ways to look at this. There's the economy and then there's the consumer. And the economy actually does not look terrible right now based on the numbers that we've just been talking about. They're all going in the right direction. What doesn't look great that no one's really talking about uh, is the shape of the consumer. 
and it's not great. You know, there was just a CNBC headline uh, about an hour ago about credit card debt hitting one trillion dollars uh, for the first time ever. You know, you look at delinquencies right now in, in credit card debt. 30-day delinquencies are up to about six and a half percent. Auto loans, 30-day delinquencies are up to about seven percent. I mean, this is the, these these numbers. You have to go back to 2011, 2010 to see those numbers. But it's not just the delinquencies in um, in 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 the credit cards and the cars. I mean, you look at you look at auto loans. I saw an interesting stat. This is the most expensive period in the history to ever own a car. There are only 8% of new cars are priced under $30,000 right now. And for the first time ever, there is actually more auto loan applications being denied than being accepted. I think the rate is like 22%. Um, and to take that a uh, step, <laughs> a step a further, it, 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 it's huge. And would you know, at, at the peak, our excess savings, household savings was 2.1 trillion uh, during COVID. We, we that number is now that was just down. the transfer payments, right? That that's that was just household excess savings, two point one. But the trillion. savings was because they were just getting an extra check from correct, all the correct. various sources. Kind but of that thing. that's so that, now that helped pay off those credit cards. And in the consumer's defense, wage growth has never been higher in the last few years. You know, four, five, six percent. So I think a lot of people probably bought more than they could on a credit card or a car or a house in anticipation of I'm going to get these five, six percent wage increases every year. Uh, this is great. And now maybe wages are falling off and I think you'll see the inflation disappear too. Yeah. I mean, personal savings rate um, is down. It's the lowest since 2007 for personal savings as a percentage of disposable income. It's down to 4.3%. The average is is nine. Um, and that's coming off of 10 and 11% numbers uh, for the previous year. So it's a little bit concerning just to see the amount of debt that's adding up, savings go down. And I think a lot of it is due to obviously the the the, the drying up of capital and the, the cost to, to borrow right now. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens on the consumer side as we continue to go through this extremely high interest rate environment. Yeah, talk about the cost of capital. The ten-year Treasury yield climbs to nine-month high. Uh, mortgage rates hit a twenty-two-year high. Uh, meanwhile, uh, high-yield bonds. Uh, the spread between them and kind of what we consider investment grade has shrunk to some of the lowest levels we've seen in the past few years. So spreads are getting tighter while yields are climbing higher. Uh, yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a concern with the yields. It's not just what the Fed has control over, which is the short end. You're now starting to see the the other parts of the curve, the long end of the curve, starting to go up. And I think it's for, I think you're seeing it for a couple of reasons. One, the U.S. just got downgraded. So that naturally is going to have a, a, a spike in, in yields, which is probably one of the reasons why you've seen the, the this small sell-off that you've seen in the last week. But also, there's something called the, a, the yen carry trade. Um, which I don't think we've ever talked about uh, on the podcast, but it it was interesting. I was reading an article by Bespoke talking about it and comparing it to the mid 2000s. And what that is, is if you have JGBs, which is, which is Japanese government bonds, we're at zero for like ever. I mean, they just came off zero, um, their 10 year bond, uh, a year ago, a year ago, they were at 25 basis points, 18 months ago, they were at zero. So you had people borrowing at zero and investing the difference in our 10 year bond, which is at 4%. So you collect the spread of 4% or, or you don't invest in our 10 year treasury. You invest in this AI boom real or the, the stock market <laughs> or real estate. And I, yeah. you're starting to see, you, you might start to see that trend unwind and that trade unwind, which is maybe why rates are, are jumping up on the back end of the curve uh, because now JGBs went from zero to 65 basis points for the first yeah, time in like 20 that, years. You know, what we're talking about is somebody borrows a lot of money in a country with low interest rates. So for example, in this case, Japan interest rates at zero. So you borrow for, let's say 1%. You come over to the United States and your expected return is 7% and you go, okay, well, I'm going to buy something that does seven. And then you make that six as a spread. Now, the risk with that is, <laughs> well, there's a lot of risk to it. But one of the major risks is what if the currency just becomes right. weaker to adjust for that? And so there's a very, we'll call it a high finance trade with this stuff. But yeah, it's harder to do when interest rates are higher, especially if they're rising in the place you borrowed. 
Yeah, and it's because the spread's so wide. We haven't seen the spread that wide in a long time where you have our 10-year government bond at over 4% and there's at almost zero. That's a big spread and there's a good enough cushion for that for that currency swap to your point. But yeah, there is there is a lot of risk, but that's where a lot of the money goes into the treasury market, comes from overseas. And if that starts to unwind, supply starts to flood the market, bond prices are going to go down and there's an inverse correlation to interest rates. So you could see rates go up and we know what happened when rates go up in the stock market. There's there's a, a negative correlation, at least what we saw last year. So I don't know if that trend will will continue to play out, but it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. And to follow up on your downgrade of the U.S., the gap between U.S. and European borrowing costs hits its widest level this year. Uh, it's now 1.6% difference between the U.S. 10-year Treasury and the German Bund. So not great to get downgraded. I mean, if you look at the basket of countries the U.S. is now with for uh, credit quality, it's uh, not great. And for debt to GDP and some other things, uh, it would be nice if uh, we'll say the politicians would address the problem. I don't have all the solutions for them, but I do would agree. Maybe spending uh, would be a good way to start. Uh, maybe tighten the purse a little bit. Um, that's where I would start from there. Um, as far as performance for bonds for the month, um, pretty flat. Uh, the uh, municipals are basically flat. U.S. bond index, uh, the Bloomberg U.S. Ag, which is you know kind of a major agency. It's only about two percent for the year, but for the month, down 007 percent. So basically nothing. Uh, a little movement on the Treasury curve. You saw. The uh, thirty-year get hurt, and you know, basically flat in short rates. So, nothing to happen in mortgage-backed securities. Nothing in preferreds. Uh, pretty quiet month at fixed income. Yep. Nope. I uh, I agree. Um, All right. Should we talk a little bit of housing and commodities? Let's let's do it. All right. So, in housing, we finally saw a turn take place beginning of last year um, from. January, sorry, from January 2023, which is the beginning of this year, uh, the prior seven months, the Case-Shiller Home Index for the national average was down 7%, and it's continued to decline. And so it looks like housing peaked and has declined primarily, I would guess, from interest rates being higher and housing prices having to come down. And again, this is national average. So if you're in a certain state or a certain city, these numbers are wildly different. And just to put in context, you know, down 7 doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but down 10 that matter. Uh, during the housing crash, they fell 35%. Um, in the housing bubble, the nine years part of that, they rose 75%. So housing prices, I think people forget, are very volatile. They can go up a lot and they can go down a lot. Um, I think because we've been riding this wave of just gains for quite a while since 2008, people forgot, hey, every month my house goes up in value. This is great. I keep making money every month. Well, it can go the other way and it finally started to. Yeah, no, and it's a it's a big metric to to keep looking at because of the core inflation number. I mean, it's almost it makes up almost two third uh, shelter, which is which is rent and, and housing costs. So that needs to come down because that's probably, in my opinion, the the biggest driver of, of the inflation number. So hopefully, it continues to move in in the right direction. But to your point, I think it's it's based on geography. You're starting to see areas that are hit a lot more that are tech tech focused and doing layoffs like. The West Coast and, and the Northeast versus areas like Texas, where there's a ton of job growth and you're probably not seeing a lot of movement in, in housing prices. Well, to take a popular phrase from the past 15 years, it might be an opportunity to buy the dip. If we were to see interest rates get cut by the Fed over the next year, I think housing prices could definitely zoom back up. And if that happens, definitely want to be a part of it, right? Yep, I, I agree. All right. Should we talk a little commodities? So what's new in oil, Tom? You're down in Houston. What uh, I, I've heard the prices of the pump are going up. We're back in the '80s on crude oil. Yeah, we're uh, we're we're back in we're back in the '80s. I don't think we're going to be be much. We've been trading in this range between the low '70s and call it high '80s, and I think we're gonna we're gonna stay there. I mean, if you look at um, you look at just the the amount of global consumption versus um, global production, uh, for, for 2023, we're supposed to have a slight, uh, surplus of 0.4%. I mean, as a, as a globe, we produce 101, uh, million barrels per day and we consume about 101 million barrels per day. A lot of that, uh, coming from China, which if they start to slow down, that's going to be the big, big driver of, of demand 
in, in, in oil. And you saw some ugly numbers come out of China last yeah, night. Deflationary, not even disinflation, but actual deflation coming out of China. That's uh, Yeah, you know, it's 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 usually supply driven oil. Um, it's not usually demands usually pretty consistent, but you could see a shift. And if and if supply starts to go up and, and demand really starts to starts to go down, um, you could see a big jump in in energy prices. But, you know, oil stocks and, and, and the energy sector last year had such a big, big run. Um, they've given up some of that this year and again, starting to make a, a slight rebound. So. Listen, I, I've always been in the camp. Alternative energy sources are not going to even make a dent into into oil it, it, for for quite some time, in, in my opinion. So I don't think it's going yeah, anywhere. Think, Go ahead. Yeah, no, our mid-month podcast, we're going to touch on the changing face of ESG and how there's a backlash against it. For Some of it's just the performance of last year and those people not participating because they didn't have any oil stocks, but also because we need it and the other options are not there yet. So um you know, the same thing is true of copper. Everybody uh, wants copper, what it provides, but nobody wants any more copper mines. Uh, the demand for copper continues to grow. Um, uh, any thoughts on gold or the other precious metals? You know, historically, gold has been has been a great in, inflation hedge, and I just don't think it. It's just stuck. It cannot get above this two thousand dollar an ounce, and when it does, it just retests and it and it drops below. And we've just been trading. We've been trading in in this range. Um, I think the the dollar obviously has a lot to do with it as well, and we're starting to see the dollar make a slight rebound. Um, I mean, we hit we hit the peak. Uh, mid last year and it's gone straight down. So I think the gold prices and commodities in general um, have a direct correlation with with the dollar or currency, which also has a correlation with with interest rates. So I think portfolios should have some sort of real assets. I've always been a believer in that. Sometimes there's 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 areas where you want to be more offensive and and have larger allocations. And then there's just times where you want to just have some exposure. I think Having exposure right now is is more than enough, and that's you know whether it's gold, copper, silver, the precious metals. Um, you know, real assets can be made up of anything. I mean, real estate, um, different types of energy stocks. So there's different ways different ways to play it. But I think I think having commodity exposure is is good. Yeah. So the last piece is just talked about the U.S. dollar that correlation was really strong in 2022. If the dollar was going up, stocks were going down. If the dollar was going down, stocks were going up. And we saw a little bit of that happen in July, where the first two weeks, the dollar had a terrible performance. You know, the first week it was down half a percent, then down 2%. And then around mid-July, it started flipping and going the other way. And you could see almost a per perfect uh, opposite <laughs> performance from the U.S. Uh, equity markets as the dollar goes up, the equity markets go down, and vice versa. So, you know, if the Fed stops raising rates, maybe the dollar gets weaker. If they continue to raise rates, I can see it getting stronger, obviously, depending on what other central banks do as well. But I think that's really we almost buried the lead for maybe why July was such a good month for equities is the dollar was down slightly. Yeah, yeah. And and so far to start this month, it's been kind of the, the opposite. So I, I agree with you. I think the Fed needs to continue to stop raising rates, which the market has that priced in um we'll see if they continue to go again but um if they stop and then eventually start to to cut next year i think you'll see you'll think you see the dollar follow accordingly all right tom for a final segment today we're going to do uh we don't even call it education we just call it five good minutes and this week we're going to talk about uh you had a better word for it i'm going to call it municipal bonds but what do you want to title this segment let's talk let's call it tax efficient income strategies all right. I love it. Um, Which, so the focus that I'd like to focus to start on that is uh, we'll talk about MLPs and some other things another time. But for today, the biggest one is just municipal bonds. So for those who've ignored this asset class like everyone else for 15 years and only really bought stocks, uh, municipal bonds are typically tax free. They're issued by state governments, by cities, by utilities, by water districts. Uh, there's various levels of quality. Um, Detroit is the only city that comes to the top of my mind that's defaulted relatively recent, recently. Um, overall, the default rate on municipal bonds is about half a percent, so a very low rate of that. The yields tend to be very low. So if you're going to go out just for the first few years and you're looking at you know high quality rated, so double A and higher, 
not <laughs> basically where the U.S. government just got downgraded to. Uh, you're only going to get about two and a quarter, maybe two and a half percent for those first few years. And so one of the things you have to know about municipal bonds is that they are tax free. And so you have to do a quick calculation to see what that yield is. And that's called tax equivalent yield. Um, would you like to jump in here or you want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah. And just a, a couple comments. One, you know, municipals is a unique asset class because it's 100% retail driven, meaning corporations aren't buying municipal bonds because they don't need the tax free income. It's mostly for individuals like yourselves, high net worth or just retired looking for tax efficient efficient strategies. Um, so to your to your point, uh, when you look at the municipal market right now, yields typically are are lower because they're they're tax free. But you have the spread right now is the widest it's been between uh, taxable and tax free. So there's what's called a muni tax equivalent, meaning if you take the same duration. So let's take the let's take the 30 year treasury at 4%. The tax equivalent muni is trading at 6% right now. Um, meaning you're getting about three and a half percent on a municipal bond versus 4% on a treasury. And if you factor in taxes, that three and a half percent is really closer to six if you're in the highest, highest tax bracket. So Either that spread has never been wider. Yeah, the government bonds. So like the U.S. Treasury, for example, you can look at the after tax, what that yield would be. And so right. today, let's say that the, you know, it's three. Well, we're going to get taxed on that at a 40 percent rate at your top tier. Uh, you're only going to get to keep you know, two thirds of that, you know, 60% of that or so. So then you're really looking at, okay, it's a 2%. So even though these yields for, you know, high quality municipals, uh, <laughs> they seem low, they're actually a lot higher. And the best example is those high tax states. So if you live in New York city, you have state tax, you have city tax and you have federal tax. So if you add all those together, your tax rate is 55.6%. So if you were to do a municipal bond and you were to buy it and let's say it yielded three and a half percent, your tax equivalent yield would be 7.88%, which means that you'd have to buy some of the worst high yield companies out there to get that kind of you know, return. And instead you can buy some pretty high quality double A rated municipal bonds. Yeah, and 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 one of the one of the biggest risks with with just bonds in general is obviously interest rate movement, but is is default risk. And if you look at municipal bonds versus corporate bonds, so not treasuries, but versus corporate um, defaulting over the last ten years, there's different tranches you have from from credit quality, from you know AAA all the way down to triple C. Um, in every single tranche, you had a lower default rate in municipals versus their versus their respective corporates. Um, also, when you look at municipal bonds versus, say, uh, <laughs> government bonds, I mean, you look at state and local debt right now as a percentage of GDP, it's low. It's about 14 and a half. 15% versus well, you know why that is though, right? our, our government debt at, at 97 versus, versus GDP. The, the states and the cities have to have a balanced budget. They right. have to, they're legally right. required to versus the federal government doesn't. And so they're at 122% of GDP because they exactly can be right. yep. um, the cities and states, they have to pay all their bills every year. And so they don't have the choice to go, Oh, we're just going to run a deficit. No, there's no deficit. <laughs> no. And, I mean, municipal bonds are, are great too, because a lot of them are, are revenue driven, you know, toll roads or, you know, sewer bonds or, or, or whatever they may be. Um, obviously there's, there's risks in, in any asset class, but right now to your point, because of where, yields are um the tax equivalent yield is very very attractive in municipals and um i think it's a great place to be as opposed to just sitting in a money market or a cd that's taxed very differently yeah so the couple things risk wise to make sure we address is uh, interest rates so if interest rates rise and you own a municipal bond that doesn't mature for 20 years uh, the value of that bond is going to go down if you just keep that individual issue so not in a fund or any in an ETF and you hold it to maturity, it will mature at par. But in the interim, you're going to see a much lower price on your bond. Uh, the other thing to consider is that quality matters a lot. So if you're going to go buy some of these cities that we know are not that well run that recently got bailed out uh, after the midterm elections, they got a lot of money and you know kind of fixed their balance sheet that way, uh, I would focus on high quality. So you can look at some general allegation for high qualities, you know, whether it's a school district or a city, uh, but you can also look at revenue. Um, you know, sewer and water debt, when they go build out the utility companies, that infrastructure, that can be really high quality. I mean, <laughs> what's the old joke? I think Warren Buffett goes, you know, what, what's the perfect investment to toll road where it's already completely built and it's never has to have any maintenance and you can just charge higher tolls. 
you know, they build out these toll road authorities. So it's a good situation from a credit quality um, and there's always ratings done on them. So you can find these by, you know, Fitch, Moody's, other places do these ratings and you can see, okay, where do you want to take a risk? And so I think that at least single A, but probably double A and higher is pretty high quality. Um, and then the last piece is just liquidity. Uh, because these are individual issues, if you wanted to go and sell them, uh, there's not always a market. Now, most of the time there is, but there's been a couple examples I can think of. I mean, March 2020 is a great one where you just there was no action. There was no bids to go buy these. So you were then stuck with them and the cash flows that go with them. So there is some of that risk. So as far as sizing in the portfolio, uh, you want to keep some emergency funds and other things in more cash like like a money market or T-bills. But if you want to go out and say, OK, I'm going to take a portion of my portfolio get tax-free income off and, you know, borrow 15, 20 years out, uh, high quality munis and making 6% on a tax equivalent basis is pretty attractive. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, you know, I have a lot of clients asking about CDs um, and I know you do as well, Kevin, and you just have to remember the, the yield and the income you're getting on a CD is taxed very differently than on a municipal. So you have to factor that in and the higher your taxable bracket is, the more typically, generally speaking, municipals would make sense because again of that, that tax equivalent yield. You could have just not want to pay taxes, right? So even if you're on a That's lower it. tax bracket, let's say you're 28% or 22% tax bracket, and you're like, I, I don't want to pay at this level. Uh, it doesn't have the same bang for the buck, but you're still going to get, you know, a three and a half. Maybe it becomes out to four and a half or five percent. Uh, it's something that's worthwhile when you know, I just don't want to pay any more taxes. <laughs> so in Texas, it's great because all your state income is exempt because there is no state income tax. Uh, in other states like California, New York, you do have to typically buy their state's bonds. So it can still be some of their toll roads for revenue bonds and other things, but uh, each state has different rules. So make sure you work with a good CPA and figure out what yours are before you just dive in and find out, wait, but I bought these California bonds, but I live in New York. That's not exempt from interest, not for state income tax. It's not. So uh, it's something to make sure you're buying the right ones and working with a good financial advisor and a CPA, uh, having your whole team together and evaluating all those risks. Uh, it's a really powerful vehicle. Yeah, no, there's 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 three buckets. There's ordinary income, there's capital gains, and then there's tax free. So you want to have a good a good mix, and everyone's everyone's different. So, well, what else you got, Kevin? Uh, well, I would just say that you know, as far as the yield curve in municipals, it actually is more favorable. It's more normal. So if you're wanting to borrow for five years, those rates are lower than if you're going to lend out for 15 years or 20 years, as opposed to in the U.S. Treasury market right now, you can <laughs> get a higher rate on six month and one year than you can on 10 year and 30 year. Uh, so it doesn't make sense. It's inverted. Uh, so I think that this asset class is something that many people you you know have ignored for a while and. You know, it's something to learn about again. And as you mentioned, it's dominated by retail. Um, there's a lot of different funds that buy these as well. But I think that it's a good fit for, you know, most people. And as far yeah, as sizing, I, I agree. Uh, we always you know, consider diversification. Uh, don't buy all of it in one issue, right? Spread it out between different states or different municipalities. Don't just buy your local city and, oh, no, the city went bankrupt and now you have a new problem. So diversify in municipal bonds matters as well. Kevin, what, what would you do? How would you feel if you were playing in the World Cup for the USA and the whole entire country hated you? Would you would you would you have missed that that penalty kick too? Well, they didn't miss one; they missed three. Two of them were air balls. <laughs> one hit the post. And Is then it, here's the other wild one. It was so the Swedish one. Or it was Sweden, right? So the the goalkeeper for the US actually makes the block, um, which you know. The play's over, right? No, it somehow has the English where it spins and goes back into the net. So I don't know. The game came on at 4 a.m. I didn't watch. I saw some of the highlights, and I think we're all disappointed that they you know, didn't go well. But, you know, all no, I've, in time. I've never seen so many bars and so many people in all parts of the country, by the way, cheering for the U.S. to, to lose. Um, it's really, we're really in a bad, bad, bad shape as a country. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, if you start to weigh into politics, it's a tough business because politics divides people. And so when you do that, you're going to make at least in this country right now, half the people mad and half the people love you. And so both sides are going to be very loud when you upset them. So that's true. That's, that's a case true. for, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, <laughs> stick to sports. We tell the radio show people like you don't have to, but if you wait into it, you're going to have a lot of blowback. And I think that some of the members of the team chose to wait into a political 
venue and you know comes with consequences and trade-offs just like any good economist would tell you yep nope i agree all right well we'll end it there and then uh we'll we'll kick it back in in two weeks um with our our mid-month podcast all right thanks tom all right you've been listening to your money momentum brought to you by global wealth advisors to learn more about gwa and its talented roster of financial professionals head on over to gwadvisors.net thanks and we'll see you next time on your money momentum All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets. (laughs) 